Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining the Institute for the Study of Sport, Society, and Social Change, our Sport um, Conversations for Change webinar today. Um, we've got some phenomenal, phenomenal panelists joining us. I'm so excited. We're going to wait a couple minutes as people come in. Uh, and so please, please sit back and get ready for a, a robust conversation um, over a number of topics. Um, relating to sport and society. As you all are tuning in, I welcome you to visit the Institute for the Study of Sport, Society, and Social Change, our website, to learn more about the programs that we do. You can find us at sjsuwordstoaction.com. You can also find us on our Facebook platform, as well as our Twitter, at SJSU Words to Action. Again, greetings, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, today's Sport Conversation for Change. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the Institute for the Study of Sport, Society, and Social Change. We've got a wonderful panel with us today. So again, I, I welcome you and have you would like you to sit back and begin to, to take a few notes of our wonderful people we have joining us today. Um, again, greetings and welcome. This is our first digital platform. We started this a few weeks ago um, at, uh, in the midst of COVID and wanted to definitely find a way to connect so a range of individuals and a number of individuals that are across the country to join this particular platform. Today's conversation is entitled Classroom and Beyond, Sport, Education, Graduate School, and Internships. This is the first, uh, again, the first webinar of our summer series as we just completed a five-part um, examination of issues at the intersection of COVID-19 and mental health. We encourage you to review the past sport conversation and join our efforts to move from words to action. I'm Dr. Akila R. Carter Francique, the Executive Director for the Institute for the Study of Sport, Society, and Social Change. The Institute was created in 2017 with the goal to honor SJSU legacy and continue the dialogue about athlete activism and the influence of sport in affecting positive social change. As our nation confronts and explores deeply complex social issues, it is critical that we continue to challenge the boundaries of sport and activism. We know that sport offers the occasion to pose those big questions, not just of athletes, but also of ourselves. Ourselves and also to provide that enlightenment um, and provide enlightening perspectives for others. Thus, the mission of the Institute is dedicated to research, analysis, and education at the intersection of sport and society. Again, to learn more about the Institute and how to be a part of the change, go to sjsuwordstoaction.com. Over the next hour, our sport conversation will try to cover all things post-graduation um, with classroom and beyond. So this topic will get into the notions of really trying to understand what are the next steps for students? Whether you are a current graduate or current undergraduate, I should say, graduate student, or considering higher education and sport. This sport conversation is for you. Faculty, academic advisors, and industry professionals, um, as you see in front of you today, will share, will share their insight on how to apply for and navigate graduate school, identify internships, and learn about sport careers. And also discuss what skill sets are needed to thrive in a range of sport industry careers. If you would like to share your story, if you have questions, um, we ask you to use the chat box below and we'll get to your questions as soon as we can. Um, we also uh, want to take a quick poll to see who's in our audience today. Um, and as we do that, I will introduce you to our amazing panel. So we have, and in no particular amazing order, Dr. Alvin Logan, Jr., Director of Education for the Burke Museum at the University of Washington. 
Uh, Dr. Alvin Logan is a critical leader focused on decol uh, decolonization and transformation of educational spaces. He's a proud product of Denver, Colorado and a former student athlete at the University of Washington. He earned his doctorate in cultural studies um, in education from the University of Texas at Austin, where he built a research profile and scholarly agenda to examine the multidimensional identity development of student athletes, decolon uh, decolonial educational spaces and discourse analysis. Dr. Logan is currently the Director of Education at the Burke Museum. Additionally, he and is on the Faculty of, in Education and Anthropology at University of Washington and Seattle University. Welcome. Next, we have Amy August. She is a PhD candidate in sociology at the University of Minnesota and Tucker Institute. Amy August is a doctoral candidate, um, again, uh, and uh, at the University of Minnesota. Her research focuses on sport, education, family, and culture. Her dissertation work uses qualitative methods, hey, <laughs> to compare the forms of social capital recognized and rewarded by teachers and coaches in school and sports. Next, we have Dr. Courtney Flowers. She's an associate professor of sport at Texas Southern University, a specialist on building cultures of inclusion in sports. Her research addresses systemic and culturally based forms of bias and prejudice. Welcome back, Dr. Courtney Flowers. She also serves as a faculty affiliate for the Institute for the Study of Sport, Society, and Social Change here at San Jose State. Next, we have Kelly Montanero. Um, founding member and director of communications for the Alliance of Social Workers in Sport. She is a sports social worker doing mental health uh, consulting, I'm sorry, mental health counseling with athletes. Um, Kelly has also been a social worker for 13 years, working in a myriad of settings, including outdoor wilderness camp, okay, <laughs> and mental health organization, and also an alternative school for students with emotional, behavioral, and mental health concerns, as well as a school social worker. She's been a track and field coach for what would have been about 20 years. Congratulations, and I'm all about track and field. <laughs> Next, we have Mark Spears. Mark is a senior MBA. A writer for the undefeated. Um, he used his, uh, I said here, um, I have is that he used to be able to dunk on you, but he hasn't been able to in years as his knees still hurt. Okay. <laughs> Mark uh, also serves on our executive board um, for the Institute. Welcome, Mark. Dr. Sean Fletcher, an assistant professor of sport and public relations, uh, of public relations and sport communications at San Jose State University. Um, he, oh my gosh, does so many things <laughs> and the work that we have done together even just recently. Dr. Fletcher has also an established, uh, established a professional development consultancy um, at SeanJFletcher.com where he works to train and develop current and aspiring leaders for culturally competent and gratifying service. He is also on our faculty uh, board with the Institute, so we welcome Sean. And last and certainly not least, Dr. Stephanie Coakley, who is a Senior Associate Athletic Director for Mental Health, Wellness, and Performance at Temple University. She's a certified mental health performance consultant and licensed professional counselor with a doctorate in exercise and sports science. In 2017, she became the first full-time mental health specialist with the Temple University Department of Athletics. She has also worked with Maximum Mental Training Associates in Washington, D.C. and the Walter Reed um, Army Medical Center. Welcome, everyone. Say hey. <laughs> My first question, yes, yes. So the first question I have out the gate for each and every one of you, um, as we look at those individuals that we have joining us today, um, athletes, coaches, faculty, students, um, a great number of individuals. So you'll be speaking to a range of, of interested parties. So we're looking forward to that. Let's see here. Let me go and so we can see all your wonderful faces without my background over there. <laughs> So my first question to each and every one of you that I want you to think about, and I start off each show with, each program with, is what does sport mean to you? In one minute, give me um, an insight of what sport means to you. And we'll go down the line here. If we could start with our veteran that's been here, Dr. Courtney Flowers. <laughs> um, it's changed. Uh, sport has, has morphed from when I was playing in high school all the way to now teaching sport. 
it's I see it as a agent of change. It's our unified voice. It allows us to have that line to be able to talk about things that are uncomfortable, like racism and segregation and marginalization. It's the one thing that we can all speak of, kind of like that one beat, one drum sort of scenario. It's that one thing that brings a community of people that are divided together. Okay, thank you. Mark Spears, our writer extraordinaire. <laughs> I think sports is the original reality show. You know, somebody has to win, somebody has to lose. Uh, you learn, uh, as thought was important in my youth to learn when I first started playing soccer that, you know, life isn't fair, man. Sometimes there's going to be a call that doesn't go your way. Um, so to me, I always think it's great, uh, regardless to whether a kid ends up playing in college or an NBA, that we put our youth into sport because I think that is one of the safest introductions to what life is really going to end up being. Okay. Amy, what does sport mean to you? For me, sport is really like a root metaphor. It's like sort of like a touchstone that I go back to and I try to make sense of pretty much anything. So like I can always liken um, like anything new that I'm trying to learn there's some parallel that I can draw to like something that I had to learn in gymnastics. Like if it's something that I'm afraid of, like in regular life, there's always that like experience of having been, you know, standing on the end of the beam, terrified of doing your flight series that you can kind of draw upon that, um, you know, just kind of serves as um, a skill set that you have to like overcome other problems. Um, it's also a way of like, inter like it teaches you ways to interact with other people. Um, whether you're in a leadership role or you're following, um, you're just being a supportive teammate. Um, it just, there's so many like skills that you acquire through the part participating in sport or coaching sport or cheering on your teammates in sport that really um, transfer to so many different um, aspects of your life that I think it's really um, just an important experience to draw upon. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Stephanie, what does sport mean to you? Good afternoon, everyone. To me, sport means challenge. Opportunities to challenge yourself across all of your domains. So whether that's intellectually, because you have to learn a skill, because nobody comes out of the womb knowing how to do their sport. And so that's an intellectual challenge. Then there are also physical challenges. There are also emotional challenges from the wins and the losses, and maybe coping with injury or being, a, being fearful of take, making a move on the beam. So there's the emotional challenge, and then certainly some of these socio-cultural challenges that we oft, we have to, like it goes without saying, like they all show up in sport, whether it's a team of all people from one race, there within there, there will be socio-cultural challenges that, that arise in the sport environment. So to me, sport means challenge, and then with that, resilience, because challenge is equivalent to adversity, right? Something's hard. I got to figure this out. And so that's an opportunity for you to develop those skills that are life skills, right? So that's challenge, right. resilience. Alvin. Uh, first, I'd like to say, Dr. Carter Francis, thank you for having me. Uh, Beth, thank you for setting this up into the Institute. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm humbled and elated to be amongst such amazing scholars and amazing people doing amazing work in field of sports um, and to be in front of you all today. Um, as part of my, my, my first answer, I would like to say that it, it means opportunity and it's a means to an end, not the end. Okay. Um, and I say that to my folks that are currently participating, my folks that are done participating, it's a means to an end. Um, and that, that's in education, that's in activism, that's in learning to develop yourself and the characteristics that you have and that you want to be used for it as that platform. Thank you, thank you. And I have Kelly and then Shonda to round us out at the end here. <laughs> um, greetings everyone, thanks for having us. Um, Akila, thanks for, for the opportunity here and Beth also for coordinating. Uh, so sport has a couple different meanings to me, uh, one through the lens of a coach. And so I would say as a coach, 
uh, sport is an extension of the classroom. It is a way that uh, valuable life lessons are taught through competitiveness and focus and disappointment and discipline. And then uh, through the lens of being a sport social worker now, I would say sport is a catalyst. And so oftentimes what I find the work that I do with student athletes is that we're digging into the deepest parts of themselves so that they can try to figure out how to overcome obstacles, how to reflect on who they are outside of being athletes, how to reflect on uh, the homes that they come from, the places that they want to go. And so I find often uh, the sport is the spark that gets us uh, to, to move forward and to see that, um, like somebody was saying, that there is, it's, it's a part of the process. It's not the end game, but it's a, it's a place that you go to travel. Uh, and so um, extension of the classroom and catalyst for me is, is what sport is from my two lenses. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Sean. I'll echo what my co-panelists said. I'm, I'm honored to, to be a part of this conversation. For, for me, sport, it's a microcosm of society. It reflects society. It's so much deeper than what we see on the playing field even. Um, oftentimes, sport is, is a step ahead of society. Uh, even even with current events, and I'm sure you all are familiar with with what is still unfolding with the remarks that Drew Brees made uh, mm -hmm. yesterday, and he's still unpacking that today. Uh, we saw within 24 hours, we saw accountability. Uh, um, we saw anger. We saw dismissiveness, feeling lost as though you were not seen. And today we're starting to see forgiveness to a certain mm -hmm. extent. And in 24 hours, sports showed us a, a cycle, if you will, of some of the, the challenges that we face, you know, interpersonally that we can navigate and almost exercise within the sport arena. And even from a personal standpoint, of course, it teaches you things like perseverance and grit and things of that nature. But within a team environment, uh, because I, I played on the football team at San Jose State long, long time ago. And <laughs> I, I, I learned in no more diverse of an environment than on that football team. Um, and, and if you want to talk about, you know, this every evasive promise that the United States tells us constitutionally about equality, I, I'd probably say the closest that I've gotten to that in a very multicultural, uh, heavily white environment was when I played team sports. Mm -hmm. A lot of it was on merit. A lot of it was, I only target what we're all collectively here to pursue. And sport is so much more than just on the field. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and, and to uh, Sean's point, I really want to take a moment for the Institute to um, step up and have a statement and with regards to the, the unfolding of this past week. Um, in that I say the Institute for the Study of Sports Society and Social Change stands in solidarity, um, stands in solidarity with all persons in the fight to end racial injustice, social inequities, and discriminatory policies and practices. We share in the grief and mourning of Black loss, um, Black lives lost, that were brothers, sisters, sons, daughters, mothers, fathers, um, and heroes and dreamers. We are inspired by the spirit and strength of communities and the call to action for social change. It is that same spirit that led a group of young black athletes and scholars in 1968 to use their platform to speak out um, and stand up for justice. Continue to push the boundaries of society and sport through activism. Um, and as the words of Dr. Harry Edwards, I want us to remember, you must move beyond the perimeter of what you know to the realm of what you dream. In that statement, I also want to check in with you all. And if you have any opinions about how are each of you doing in this moment? How are you coping with the realities of COVID-19 and the recent deaths of Black men and women? How are you coping with the protests that have unfolded across the country and for some of you in the very homes that you're in right now? Amy, I want to go ahead and start with you. You are in Minneapolis. Talk to us a little bit about how you're doing in this, this process. Yeah, um, 
Well, things here have been pretty hectic and chaotic lately. Um, and I have some family members that are immunocompromised and um, that's been made it hard to like join in the protests on the ground. Um, so what I've really kind of focused on doing, I mean, and I think my coping mechanism maybe is just to do something, you know, rather than sitting home and thinking about it. Um, and that's, that's made it hard. Um, but I think I've been doing some research with, um, with a research team that I'm involved in and we, we've been doing interviews with children about um, like how they've experienced the ending of their extracurricular activities doing to, um, due to the COVID cancellations. Um, so just kind of, I mean, even though like the focus of the interviews is supposed to be about, you know, how they feel about extracurricular activities, um, they're really kind of emoting and processing everything that's happening in the Twin Cities right now. So just kind of providing um, like a sounding board to listen to their experiences and giving them the opportunity to kind of talk through what they're, what they're feeling um, has, been, has been sort of one way that I feel like I can kind of provide support for some people who are, are you know, processing what's happening. And then another thing that I, um, strategy that I've kind of used to try to be active and um, further social justice has been through the Society Pages, which is a, an online newsletter um, website where we translate social science research for a public audience. And so we've really started to um, gather lots of perspectives of different social scientists on what's happening right now um, throughout the world, really. Um, you know, whether it's um, about racial injustice or policing or police brutality or um, social movements, just kind of pulling together a bunch of different um, research pieces and then translating them for to educate a broader audience about things that we know as sociologists that maybe the rest of the world um, isn't tuned into um, to try to help others process what's happening in the Twin Cities. So that's kind of been my strategy. Um, you know, as far as as far as coping with, yeah, you know, the horrific times in the Twin Cities right now. Uh, we've got some of you on here that are are parents to Black children. Anyone want to jump in and just sort of share how you've been sort of managing that, communicating what's going on in the world? I know I've had my own struggles with a five year old and an eight year old, trying to explain to them the riots and um, what some would consider rioting, what some would consider protest, um, uh, anger, frustration that's being demonstrated by our various communities. Um, how are you communicating that? How are you managing their understanding of these times? I mean, obviously, again, we work with student athletes, but how are you managing young children? And again, perhaps even um, the, the college students that you may be communicating with. Dr. Flowers? Yep, I'll, I'll jump in here. I have a seven-year-old and I'm a child of protests. Um, my mom definitely had me on the picket lines way before even Skyler, you know, before I was seven. I mean, they, that was kind of known just growing up in Detroit and everything that was happening in the automotive industry, you know, it was just really, really close home to my family. So that was something I knew. I struggle as a parent to really help my daughter to really unpack some of the things that she's seeing on TV. My husband and I have been really, really open with her with answering her seven-year-old questions. Um, one of the things that in the space growing up in Houston, Texas, my daughter hasn't had to face some of the obstacles, some of the marginalizations that I faced. And so her maturity regarding race and gender is not as quiet as where I was at her age. And so also being aware of that, um, you know, it, it is frightening. You know, one of the things that I was jokingly sharing with the neighbor yesterday is, you know, I would be in a whole nother place if I had a young black man. You know, you feel a little sense of security with a girl. Uh, with a young black man, it's more detriment. I have to have these conversations because if I don't, they're dangerous. And that kind of brings me to the space of being an internship coordinator and actually having students and having to teach during the summer and having those young African-American males, Caucasian males, Hispanic males, Asian males, I could go on and on and on because just not African-American males are impacted by this. We also have others that are impacted just as much. 
And so just understanding how to reach out to them, how to be a resource, um, not invading too much. <laughs> I have learned sometimes you feel as an, and you know, as a coordinator, as a professor, you know, I, I need to help you. You need to help. And the kid on the other end is like, I really don't need help. I need you to leave me alone. So just being respectful of that space while they're in, you know, unpacking what they need to unpack, but also letting them know that this is okay. We'll get through this kind of being that beacon of light um, around so much negativity right now is pretty much been my, my outlook. Thank you for that commentary. Again, my oldest is a black female, eight year old, but I have a, a black son. Um, so it's, 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 it's challenging um, to, to sort of speak that you think he's cute now, but at what age will he become a threat um, to others is, is always that question in the back of your mind. Um, Sean, could you share a little bit about how you are um, managing those things and then we'll, we'll move into um, our next area of just kind of talking about the internships as uh, Dr. Flowers was speaking on. Sure and, and I won't go too far into to depth because I'll get emotional and you don't want to see the, the waterworks. Yes. Um, I, I, have a, I have a seven-year-old daughter and a, a three-year-old almost four-year-old son mm -hmm. um, and of course and thankfully my son is too young to have those conversations that again will disproportionately impact him, unfortunately, over my daughter. But my daughter, we don't, while we do shield her from certain things, because there is a certain sociological element to this, I do not want to completely strip her of her optimism and innocence yeah. uh, of going through this world as a, a young black woman that she is growing up to be. However, we don't turn the channel as we're right. watching it. Um, we open it up for her to ask questions if she chooses to. And she's, she's, she's realized that she was a black girl um, a couple of years ago. Yeah. When her, her, her friends asked her why her hair was the texture it was. When she came home wondering why she wasn't white and fair skinned like mm -hmm. her friends wow. there. So she realized that a long time ago. So she had, she already has a certain air of savvy um, than, than I did even growing up in St. Louis, Missouri, which was heavily racially tense. So while we don't, we don't shy away from her questions and having those conversations with her and her curiosity about what's going on and keep in mind, we're still trying to explain to her why we've been sheltering in place. So, <laughs> exactly. Uh, again, uh, again yeah. overloading a seven-year-old with some very, very lightning in the bottle issues that we keep saying are once in a lifetime, but we've experienced them a couple of times now. So from that standpoint, <laughs> you know, my wife and I are very cautious about what we expose her to, but we don't shy away if she has questions and if she has those, you know, tense types of moments, but we want to preserve a certain air of innocence as well. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I, I definitely understand. Again, we've had moves on the television, you know, the, the broadcast going on and again, engaging them in those questions when they're ready. Um, but um, it, is a, it is a tough time and a, a, a definite balance to try to allow them to be their seven, eight, you know, nine-year-old selves and um, but at the same time, make them aware of the social issues that are taking place. Thank you for sharing that. As we move into today's topic of discussion, again, we're gonna get into sport education, interim and experience, um, and uh, again, this, this social justice work that we do. Um, I wanna know from, um, oh my gosh, from Alvin, <laughs> Dr. Logan, can you tell us with regards to sport education, um, what your degrees were? I think one thing I, I will appreciate, our, our, our panelists were, were all athletes, which is amazing. But talk to me a little bit about how you navigated your undergraduate degree and deciding what you wanted to be and then began to seek graduate school. Um, what was that like for you? Yeah, thanks for, uh, thank you for your question. I hope everybody can hear me now. I connected yes. with the phone. So. <laughs> Wonderful technology, we figured it out, right? <laughs> um, so I went to University of Washington. I was a two sports student athlete, played football, ran track, and that dominated my undergraduate experience. Uh, my time, my energy, mental capacity. Um, but fortunately and unfortunately, I suffered a career-ending injury my true senior year. 
um, and was not able to compete my last two years. And that forced me to really be um, plugged in academics. Um, and in that turn, I was able to to explore new new ends and really dig into who I was and what I wanted to do post college and who I was as a man growing up as someone who um, is trying to influence society. Um, it took me it took me a lot of tries. I had five different tries at majors, and you know, for my folks in the audience that are in college, if if it takes you a couple of tries, if it takes you extra year, extra two years, don't worry about it. It's all about your time and your journey. Um, and for me. That was five different majors. I finally landed on urban planning. Um, and the reason I landed on urban planning is I decided to um, open a real estate business when I was in college. And that was like being able to buy homes and move families from low income areas into um, more higher resourced areas so that they could go to a better school district. Um, and that that had been that had been, you know, decent. I, I was able to acquire one home. I was able to move one family. And um, then I went to graduate school. Um, which was a decision that was kind of like, you know, I don't know what to do after this. I got this. I can still go to school. But I know I told my family and I, I told my father and I told um, my grandma before she passed that I would get a Ph.D. Okay. Um, and, you know, I, I went to, to the University of Washington again for my master's, which was in um, our version of sports management, which is called the Intercollegiate Athletic Leadership Program. Um, one year program, it's really a practitioner based. And within that, I was able to connect with folks, especially my first black professor at the University of Washington, um, Dr. Joe Lott. And he connected me with the folks that are doing great work with um, the Heman Sweat Center down at the University of Texas. And lo and behold, the network pushed me and propelled me through to be able to get my, uh, my PhD. And might I add, because of that network, I was able to work and I don't now, I, I now don't have student loan debt from my undergrad or my PhD. Um, and when, when we get to talk about that part, I would definitely, I would definitely dig in there. But yeah. for the folks who do not pay for graduate school, there are dollars out there for you all, okay? Um, you. Because, man, college is a scam right now. The information <laughs> is necessary. Everything you can get from it is necessary, but the, the price tag on it is a scam to us all, which I, I believe college should be free for us all, and that's just per my personal feeling. Um, even graduate school should be free for us all. It's my personal feeling because it's knowledge and it, it uplifts our, our entire country, our entire world when we're able to gain knowledge. Um, but I, I was able to matriculate through and earn my PhD from the University of Texas because of the different networks that I was able to plug into, because I was willing to talk to faculty, because I was willing to, to email folks and say, hey, I'm here at the school. I, I, I want to connect with people I don't necessarily know to connect with, but I want to make sure I'm getting to the right places and seeking out the right folks to be able to move and matriculate through um, my academic career. So um, that, was, that was the reason why I was propelled to go into graduate school because I didn't necessarily know what I wanted to do, but I know I wanted to have an impact and an impact on a lot of student athletes because after I finished playing sport, I turned around and mentored a lot of my teammates. And that was to be further connected on campus. That was to be further connected with the community. Um, but that was essentially my path through graduate school and then networking to be able to move beyond into my PhD and now further back at the University of Washington, trying to continue to solidify a lot of work that I started while I was there. Thank you. Thank you. Amy, you're, you're in the, the trenches now um, and a few more days before you defend your dissertation. So congratulations on that. <laughs> um, what were your steps in identifying the doctoral program for yourself? Okay, How well, you, I also... Yeah. I also had a rather circuitous route. I had four majors as an undergrad, not quite as okay. many as Dr. Hogan. Um, but then I, then I coached for a while right after school, and then I realized that I really liked working with kids. So then I went and I got, I, I decided to get a master's in teaching. So I did that, but as I graduated, it was right at the peak of the recession, so it was hard to find a job. So I taught English in Japan for a while first. And then I came and I was a high school English teacher. And that was right around the, uh, the recession of 2008, 2009, 2010. So I was repeatedly laid off for three years in a row. Um, and it but the whole experience really got me interested in how um, schools are funded and how inequitably they're funded. And I, I, I began to kind of realize that my positionality um, as a, like a white woman, as a teacher, um, while I had a lot of privilege, um, I wasn't necessarily the voice that the um, people who had the capacity to make changes on a systemic level we're, we're listening to. So um, I, 
when I, the third time that I was afraid I was going to get laid off, I applied to the University of Chicago. Um, and I, being a first, like I was a first generation um, undergrad graduate. Um, so I didn't necessarily know the way that you're supposed to do that when you're applying to grad school. Um, so I didn't have a single person with a PhD write me a letter of recommendation. I had absolutely no idea what was supposed to go in a personal statement. I just like described my life, right? I didn't have a, a project in mind or anything. But what, what happened to be very fortunate was that I had a line on my CV that said that I was a, um, a scholarship athlete at the University, or University of Illinois at Chicago. I had done gymnastics there. So anyway, the um, director of the program, the MAPS program at the University of Chicago was John McAloon, who himself was an athlete um, who almost made it to the Olympics, but he was also like an Olympic studies scholar. So I think he was willing to take a chance on me as a probably a less than desirable candidate because of that experience and because of the um, credibility I think um, you have as an athlete in terms of like your ability to work hard. Um, so I went there and then um, I got much more savvy about the application process and like how you really should think about um, applying to a PhD program um, in terms of like selecting the discipline that is like the most appropriate for what you want to do. And then um, doing research on different departments and trying to identify the scholars who are currently doing work that are, that's related to the project that you want to ultimately conduct for your dissertation. Um, and so with a lot of mentoring and a lot of help and a lot of um, social networking too. Um, I was able to um, select 10 programs that I then applied to um, that were pretty good fits and I was accepted at three and then after doing the um, campus visits. Um, I, I really like I, I had a really strong connection with Doug Hartman at the University of Minnesota. Um, and his project like what he was working on was really, really germane to my research interests at the time. Um, so then I you know, accepted their offer and went there and haven't looked back. Thank you so much. So with all these long stories, and, and I say long stories, but beautiful journeys, because I don't know how many majors I had, had as well. I switched back and forth a few times myself. Um, how do we select a grad program? What are the criteria? What makes a good graduate school? What makes a good choice for you? Uh, Courtney, could you just give us some quick insight on a few pieces of the criteria and identifying those particular programs. From there, we'll jump into, hold on, we've got calls coming into my house. From there, we'll jump into um, understanding internship experiences for our other panelists. Perfect. Um, the one thing that I looked at was, I, I knew fairly early on that I wanted to do some work with Title IX, unfortunately, as a female golfer, you learn about Title IX a little earlier than other people. Um, <laughs> so being an undergraduate, I, I was unfortunately introduced to Title IX and gender equity very quickly. And so I knew my path. And so I, I was seeking out people who were doing work in Title IX and learned quickly there were a lot of people that were doing work on Title IX. And so I said, well, I like law. And so at that time, most of the books that I was reading in law had one name, Todd Seidler, Todd Seidler, when it came to risk. And so I was looked and I said, where is this Todd Seidler at? Oh, University of New Mexico. Okay, that's where I'm going. The first thing that I would say is to find somebody that you enjoy reading. Um, reading was always that if I, I feel kind of overwhelmed, reading a book will take me away. And so I'm a reader. And if you find somebody that is pretty much has done that path where it's already laid out for you and they're at a specific school, that's another good way. Um, just having a chance to work under him and learn under him to me was priceless. I mean, even though I've been away from New Mexico now, I graduated, geez, 09, I still consider Dr. Seidler as one of my mentors that still guides me right now. And so if you can align yourself with somebody that can kind of even help you map it out, um, the other pull to University of New Mexico was while I was at Grandma State working on my degree in um, sport administration, uh, Dr. Joy Griffin came down and she spoke to us about Native Americans and sport. And her presentation was so enlightening and I was just drawn to her and I was, and, you know, she introduced me to sports psychology. 
and I was blown away. And I said, I just, I don't know if I want to be a sports psych student, but I would love to take some of these classes. And so again, go to these webinars, go to virtual, especially right now, the virtual conferences and listen to what people are saying and see if you have an interest. It may not be your full guide. Like I've always been strong sport management, but I was really interested in taking some sports psych classes. And so sometimes it's something, that little small thing that that professor meant that, you know, that person, that person may share with you, they kind of pull something in you that says, yeah, that's interesting. Also, very, very important scholarship opportunities, <laughs> graduate teaching opportunities as well. Let that be a guide. So many programs offer free tuition. Tuition remission is the actual language. Scholarships for students that are interested in researching this or that. I, I can't tell you how many times I'll have a student that comes to me and says, I want to go to graduate school, but I don't have an idea what I want to do. The first thing I said, you know, I'll tell them is who's paying? Let's go. Let's get them to pay and we'll figure the path out through the payment. <laughs> so sometimes okay. it's figuring that out as well. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, and thinking about that and, and trying to identify programs. Um, I know I went through a range. I, I honestly feel like I got tricked into getting <laughs> <laughs> my doctorate degree um, by individuals seeing things in me. Um, I want to understand a little bit more on um, some, some of the journeys that, uh, the, again, you all as amazing panelists have provided. Mark Spears, can you give us um, a, a synopsis of your graduate experience and what that was like for you, inclusive of the importance of internships, um, externships, and what it took to become a senior writer, you know, for ESPN? You're on mute right now. <laughs> ah, there you I'm go. I'm going to start on the internship the thing. Uh, I, I got yes. some great advice um, when I went to junior college and then the University of D.C., San Jose State, chasing my basketball dream mm -hmm. um, to get as many internships as possible in college. And I think that's where a lot of students make a mistake. Um, I wrote for the Foothill College newspaper. I wrote, wrote for the University of DC newspaper. I wrote for the Spartan Daily. I also, my first internship, I did it for free. It wasn't about money. So I asked San Jose Metro, all you guys are probably familiar with. I wrote them a letter and asked them, hey, do, do you have anybody writing sports uh, for you during the summer? And they said, no, we'd love for you to do that. So I did that and I got, uh, great clips the next year through the National Association of Black Journalists, and I think everybody needs to join, join some major organization in their field of interest. I just asked to get into their internship program, and I swear they were, the, I was the last one picked. Um, they sent me to Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I went to Grand Rapids, Michigan uh, the summer before my senior year at San Jose State. I got to do a Cubs game. I got to interview a young Floyd Mayweather Jr. I got to do the U.S. Oh. Olympic Festival, if you guys remember that. Yeah. So now all of a sudden, that was the only internship offer I had. But then going into my senior year at San Jose State, um, one of my teammates actually had gotten interviewed by a, a columnist, Bud Geraci, from the San Jose Mercury News. I bugged him, and this was actually during my redshirt year, uh, at, uh, about... Uh, being a journalist and how can you help me? The squeaky wheel gets the oil. Two days after I bugged Bud Geraci about what do I need to do to help myself be a sports writer, he had me in the San Jose Mercury News taking phone calls for high school football games. They got confident in me. A couple months later, I was covering high school basketball games when I had free time, getting my byline in the San Jose Mercury News and then after my senior year of college, when I graduated from San Jose State, all of a sudden the next year, I had all this experience and I was able to get a job at the Dallas Morning News as an intern, uh, wow. which was at that time, their Sunday sports page in 95 was 75 pages long. So that was a major internship. And then my first job, I got to cover Arkansas football and basketball team. So I fast forward that to grad school if you handle your business in college in terms of getting internships, in terms of getting experience, in terms of taking advantage of what your school offers you in terms, like for me, it was writing on the school paper. I don't think you need to go to grad school, at least in my business, right after you graduate from college. In my business, the problem is a lot of these kids 
waste time while they're in college, not getting any experience of any kind, and then wonder why they can't get a goddamn job once they graduate. You need to have, you have to differentiate yourself from everybody else. And that's what they're not doing. They're not, I differentiated myself from everybody else. And by the time I graduated from San Jose State, I felt like I was a first round draft pick. I was covering the SEC out of college, right? And I also wasn't scared to go work in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I worked, I didn't, I left San Jose. I got out of the nest. I went to Tulsa, Oklahoma for my first job. When did I go to grad school? Two years ago. I went to LSU. Reason why I decided to go to grad school all of a sudden, okay, I got 21 years of experience now covering the NBA, 25 now as a sports writer. Now, how can I take myself to the next level? My family's from Louisiana. I'm good in California. I wanted to be good where my family's from in, in Louisiana. So loved LSU Tigers always. Got my master's uh, uh, in, but I didn't get it in journalism. I got it in sports business management at LSU. So now I have the ability to work for a sports franchise. I have the ability to maybe be the AD at San Jose State one day, or I could teach at San Jose State, which Miss Miss Doyle, I'm trying to do, uh, <laughs> trying to teach one a class in the in the spring if you let me. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I'm. I, I I didn't go to grad school till later because I handled my business in undergraduate. I just want to drop the mic right now <laughs> because I did the journey is so amazing to hear each and every one of us on this panel has been through a journey. And I think that's the message I, I want to make sure that our, our audience and our young people watching this understand we didn't know it in school. We didn't know it out of school. We figured it it out. We made some decisions. We went right, then we thought left might be good, and we went back and right again. So to understand that it is a journey, and it is what you make it. Um, you know, I took a couple years myself after undergrad before I went back to get my um, doc, my, not, sorry, my master's degree, and then I took another year break before I, I got my doctorate. But for some, the journey is not direct, and getting that field experience, getting that life experience can add so much more to that particular journey. With that, I want to jump into before I kind of uh, we unpack some of the careers and desired careers, if you will, um, for our panelists. Wanted to share one of our um, panelists that could not be with us today, um, as she is in, currently in the trenches. Um, I say, uh, let's see if I can get her to pop up here for me. Yeah. There we go. There we go. Um, we have uh, Farlone Toussaint. She could not be with us here today. She is uh, the Atlanta Program Officer with the Laureus Foundation. She has a decade of experience as an advocate for using sport as a catalyst for social change. Um, everybody hear me? Okay, just want to make sure. Um, for using sport as a catalyst for social change. Her passion blossomed in 2007 alongside the Honorable Archbishop Desmond Tutu during a youth symposium hosted by Willock College targeting Boston public school student leaders. Her experience working on both the college and professional level has allowed her to gain a greater insight into sport for development programming, growth strategy, and implementation. She has supported community relations and corporate social responsibility efforts for several professional sports teams, including the Los Angeles Kings and the Boston Celtics. She has also worked with professional athletes, both active and retired, on various social entrepreneurial initiatives. Farlone is an Atlanta native, where she is also a consultant in the creative cause marketing arena and holds a Bachelor of Science in Management with a concentration in marketing from Boston College Carroll School of Management. She has an amazing- And she could cross um, over people with heels on. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> we do all this. We do all this heels and nails. Did you see yeah, that? I see. I see. Um, <laughs> so I want to share a little bit of what um, Laureus for Sport does. She, like I said, she's in the trenches right now. She um, actually got called in, um, in to identify, um, to receive some grant dollars to then identify and distribute to local organizations in the Atlanta community that are doing good work through sport. So give me a quick moment and we'll um, share this little video with each and every one of you about the amazing work that she does along with um, Laureus Sport for Change. Um, 
And let's see here. And hopefully, here. You guys here? gives you just a little bit hold on here let me shut some things down um i want to know from each of our panelists um and we'll start with uh dr coakley um and then move to kelly um with regards to was this the career you always desired well actually a little bit but not really i um i always knew several things about myself Wanted to help, wanted to serve, wanted a PhD, wanted to work with children. So that was what I took to school with me every day through elementary all the way to high school. And then in college, I was able to walk in the door knowing I wanted to be a psychology major. I wanted to help in that space. And um, graduated and immediately pursued working in mental health environments and hospitals and group homes and in Philadelphia in West Philadelphia and North Philadelphia. And I love that work. I, I got burnt out though. So um, while I have a passion for that work, it, it's hard. It's hard work. And so I still do that on many, many levels, but I merged my other passion, which is sport and physical activity with that work to help others and kind of devoted my my the rest of my second part of my career to working in sport environments and so while it was always in me I, I had to get there once again i had to get there and so i feel really fulfilled working in the sport and exercise space helping athletes learn to manage all these emotional and mental challenges associated with competing and performing on a high level every single time and not just in their competitive environments but like in practice and in a classroom and all, in all these many domains so i feel really fulfilled working in that space and even working at temple which is my alma mater you know, it, it just takes it to another level that I'm yeah. grateful that I'm able to like lend, you know, give back to the institution that just gave me all this, the knowledge that I have 
to that prepared me to work with the youth, the youth. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. I met you, you know, years ago and was, she was doing amazing work then. And it's just amazing how our paths um, come back together and cross at this particular path um, and point. Um, Kelly, give us a little insight. Who inspired you to pursue your career and, and develop your craft? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I don't know that I have a, a solid answer, to be honest. I was, I was thinking, Dr. Coakley and I have some things in common as far as helping people, athletics, working with kids. Um, I think that my, I went to undergrad knowing that I wanted to go to grad school, also as a first generation college student. I just wasn't sure exactly what that was gonna look like. And I know that sport played a big role in my life as it related to keeping me occupied after school. My mom was a single mom. Um, it, it, it built relationships with mentors. One of my, my high school coach is still a mentor of mine now who I call whenever there's a hiccup in, a, in track practice or I can't get a kid to get his elbow down or I can't do something, it's an immediate call. And so I think that I knew I really enjoyed all of those things. And I feel as though my experience as a social worker and as a coach, I just kept stepping boldly in the direction when doors would open, I just kept walking towards the light. That sounds really like a cliche, but sometimes their cliches are really true, unfortunately, or fortunately. And so for me, I was doing social work and I was coaching and I realized that a lot of my social work interventions were really effective with my student athletes. And so I started sharing that, uh, those ideas with my best friend who worked at the University of Michigan School of Social Work. And she shared them with one of her supervisors who was already running a sport and social work class, like a mini session class. And so I started teaching those mini session classes at U of M that led to um, working uh, with Emmett and Matt Moore and Ginger and the whole group of social work and sports people that's now the Alliance of Social Workers and Sports. So I don't know that I ever thought that I would be a sports social worker at a D1 Power 5 school, but I don't know that I didn't know that because I just kept stepping boldly in the direction of, of things that were opportunities. And you know, even just hearing about the opportunity on the Alliance COVID call from you for this. So I just emailed you like, let's just put, dip our toe in and, and see what it's about. And so I think, I don't know, I'm guessing my friends would say, we always knew you were going to be a social worker. And I'm guessing my coaches would have said, you always wanted to share that knowledge. And I had such a great experience with athletics that I wanted to share that. And I know a lot of people don't always have that experience. And so I also want to honor that and, and recognize that. And so I think, I don't know that I knew, but I'm guessing that all the people around me that knew me as I was growing from young adulthood to early, um, early adulthood to you know, middle adulthood now, um, they would have said, yeah, this is exactly where we would have guessed you would end up. Even if I didn't know it, the universe did and provided opportunities that I just sort of continued to step boldly into. Thank you, thank you. Um, Dr. Fletcher, Sean, you worked at Apple before coming over into this realm. Tell me a little bit about, again, was, was this the career path for you? Do you have a mentor? What sort of got you into doing the work that you're doing now? Uh, I'd be lying if I told you that I knew I would be where I am now 20 years ago. Um, <laughs> but I, I will say, you know, much like when, when we're children, when we say that I want to be an astronaut, doctor, lawyer at the same time, uh, I knew that I wanted to blend education and sport at some point. I didn't know how. I was going to do that. And I took circuitous routes to try to do that. I worked for the Washington Redskins for a, a couple of years in scouting, trying to figure out if how could I get sport into it. Um, I knew that at a certain point, education was going to be something that naturally brought me gratification because I, I come from a, a long line of, of kind of street teachers. They didn't get paid for it, but they always were looking to guide, to mentor, to coach even. Um, my father, my mother, aunts, uncles, they just did it. And I saw it. And it was something that brought me gratification on a number of different levels. So I knew at some point, once I got my act together, after I graduated from San Jose State with about a 2.5, <laughs> <laughs> I use my, my story as a, as a cautionary tale when I talk to students, not as exemplary. All right. So once I figured that part out 
And then I realized that I didn't really know what I fully wanted to do. And my transcripts were too ugly to go and, and go to all these, pres these prestigious schools that we speak of. Uh, the University of Central Florida was the only school that allowed me to, to admit on a probationary status. And I was forced to prove myself, once again, just like sport. And I didn't get fully accepted into the University of Central Florida's organizational communication program until the semester I graduated. I do wow. not tell people to take that route, ever. <laughs> All right. And then I realized that uh, through some opportunities and mentorships, my mentor, Dr. Rufus Barfield, who's still at Central Florida, one of the few uh, um, long term, long time faculty down there, he took me under his wing. He's a, uh, he was a Howard alum uh, and he told me, he said, listen, get some experience over here uh, working with cultural competency at this hospital that I do work for. And I'm a kid, snotty nose, coming off of a football scholarship. And I'm like, what? What do you want me to do? I didn't even take school seriously at that point. <laughs> and then he said, okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you where you need to be. And I started to realize that I had been selling myself short and I was underachieving to a certain extent. And I put that tenacity from the playing field over into the, the academic arena and professional arena. And then I decided, you know what, I kind of like this. I kind of like this taking academia seriously. And he said, listen, man, uh, have you thought about um, a, a doctorate to further this love of education of yours? If you want to take the <laughs> pinnacle, do it. And I said, no, I hadn't thought about a doctorate. <laughs> and they're not thinking about me. So I said, okay, well, listen, let me put some fillers out there knowing that I'm going to get back a bunch of thank you, but no thank you. Um, and that, that's what happened. And Howard University said, you know what? I see the trajectory that you're trying to take. And very similar to many in your situation, for whatever reason, I see that what you did in the past is not reflective of what you can do. Right. And I was in tears when I got that letter back. And, and they told me, we'll take you. And we're also going to give you a teaching associateship with the stipend. So we're going to pay for right. your, your education here. You just got to teach for us. Mm -hmm. And it was over at that point. I fell in love with it. I fell in love with the empowerment that I got from it. I got to learn on the job while I was getting educated in Washington, D.C. Oh, my goodness. I was in love with it. And it just took off from there. And then I found myself realizing that, you know what, I don't want to be, I don't want to be that instructor that can just tell you what to do because I didn't do it myself. Yeah. So I decided that, you know what, I'm going to get some industry experience, much like, like Mark was saying. And I took a 10 year hiatus to an, a certain extent. It was strategic. Another extent, <laughs> like Amy was saying, I graduated during the height of the economic recession too. There were no jobs. So mm -hmm. I jumped into the the public relations field stayed there for a decade decided it was time for a number of reasons got back into uh, academia and now i can tell people mm -hmm. what it's like as opposed to giving you some ideology and academic the uh, 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 theoretical perspective of what it's like and it came full circle and now i'm able to create sport communication classes that blend uh -oh. that love <laughs> So now it all comes full circle. Hey, it, it's got to go that route. And in some sense, it, it has to go that way, you know, for us to really sort of fully engage into this work. Um, I think about, again, the notion of mentors. I think of following your path. But I also want to be mindful, again, sort of at the top of the show, was talking about, you know, I don't know if you consider, but I consider the work that each and every one of you do as social justice work. And so Mark and Alvin, could you give us a little insight on to, again, you know, did you, how did mentors shape your career path? And, and in that, did you, do you consider yourself doing social justice work? And if so, can you sort of explain as far as sport advocacy, sport activism, give us a little insight on that. Uh, well, I guess I'll go first uh, real quick. Um, and one, Sean is right. I had a, a 2.8 GPA um, that I graduated with at San Jose State. And despite my experience, that allowed me to get my GRE waived. I had to be on probation at LSU at first. Not embarrassing that was to be on probation because I didn't take my GPA serious enough. 
in college and I end up getting a 4.0, which is, but pay attention to what you're doing in college now because it could affect you 20 years later. Um, to your other question, uh, I, I'd known early on in, if, if I had the opportunity to write about social justice that I would do it. Uh, I come from a family that's dealt with a lot of racism their entire lives. Um, and it, it's just been natural for me to talk about, even though my own employers and my own bosses, my own editors have tried to censor me throughout my career. And mm -hmm. luckily I've had the opportunity to write for ESPN's The Undefeated, which is a site about race and culture and sports. I'm so blessed to be in this position to be a senior NBA writer, the only NBA writer I think in the world that is devoted to writing about race and culture, which is, is certainly a blessing to me. And so this week, in the midst of my work, I, I talked to Steven Jackson, who's in, in front of the George Floyd movement on Instagram Live for 45 minutes, and, th and that went super viral. I interviewed Devin George, who my friend, uh, Miss August, uh, he's from Minneapolis. Um, he's uh, played for the Lakers, he has a big voice there. And he's not only extremely in pain by what happened as a black man, but he has buildings there and he's put up pamphlets of him and Kobe Bryant hugging each other, playing together, like saying, hey, I'm a black man and this is my business. Please don't burn it down. So right. um, it feels good to me that my work is more than just writing that the NBA is coming back and who might get traded and like to, to write about things that could change lives change med mentalities, give some depth, wake people up. And that to me makes me feel like my work will uh, be alive uh, long past um, my last breath. Thank you, thank you. Alvin, even in, in doing uh, this work, um, I, I wanted you to speak to that, but also add to it. You know, we have a lot of student athletes that are also sort of being prompted you know, to participate in this social justice work or students that are not athletes that are wanting to get engaged in that. Can you speak to, again, your path into the social justice work and advice for them and sort of best practices for balancing their activism with their education or their activism with their athleticism um, and, and doing it feeling, I guess, safe, knowing that their scholarship or their future career they may pursue um, perhaps is not, you know, put in jeopardy. Yeah, that's, that's definitely, um, I appreciate you for adding the layers to that question because that's a complicated one. That's something yes. that student athletes are dealing with across the country. And it's one that I, I shame athletic departs, departments for. I mean, that's, that's, that, that's egregious to take some my scholarship to strip what they want that they've been working for their entire life just because they're standing up for a cause, they're standing up for their life, they're standing up for the fact that we don't matter how we should matter in America. Um, and I, me personally, I, I can't go anywhere and not have it be with the focus of social justice. Um, I stand on the back of my ancestors. I'm reaching for the stars and I want to continue to bridge that gap to the stars as much as I can so that folks coming behind me can be able to do that as well. And I take that stance with me everywhere. Um, a lot of places I've been, I've been either the only or one of two, maybe three black folks in the place men, women, and so forth. And it, it just, it fuels me to, to create pipelines for people to get in there, um, for people to come and do work, for people to create connection to the community. And everywhere I've been, every institution I've been a part of, that has been my mission. Um, for the student athletes really facing, having to decide between your activism, your scholarship, and, and you know, really focusing on school. I mean, it's, it's a difficult, it, it's a balancing act. Um, but I, I will tell you, as a former student athlete, if you don't stand up for what you believe in, they're not going to, nobody's going to stand up for you. And nobody's going to stand behind you, especially your coach in your athletic department. If you don't stand up for what you believe in, they're not going to stand behind you. And that's the difficult reality that I had to face, the difficult reality that a lot of student athletes are having to face right now because they're having to turn their teammates, look at their teammates, and, you know, ask, like, how come you're not feeling how I feel? How come mm -hmm. you don't hurt how I hurt? And we've sat here and we play, we've communicated, we've built a relationship, but you don't share my pain in this. Um, and I'm, I'm currently teaching a class, um, Anthropology and Sport. And I had one of, our, one of our student athletes express to me, he said, 
I have I'm in contact with a lot of the, the freshmen that are that are coming up and he's like the coaches won't say anything. The teammates are saying you gotta go to practice, you gotta do X, Y, and Z and you know I'm I'm frustrated because I wanna go be on the front lines. I wanna go protest for my life. I wanna say, you know, my life matters and I wanna show that with the action that I do. And he's getting adverse reactions from his coach. He's getting adverse reactions from his teammates. And I told him, I said, okay, this is a point in time where they're showing you who they are. Um, and as far as your scholarship, man, that's, that, that's something that can be fought. That's something that can be, can be brought to it. And there's folks that need that attention at the higher level within the university, not just the athletic department. Um, and if there's, there's missions and things to be fought, I, I, I say this as someone who is willing to fight for you, is willing to be a voice for you, um, and I'm willing to jump through hoops for you and talk to the administrators and talk to the people that need to be talked to and really knock on the doors that need to be knocked on. And I imagine that the folks on this call feel similar to me, and I don't want to put words in everybody's mouth, but I am here to support. We are here to support. Um, and this is not just your struggle. Please do not feel alone in this. Um, so in, in the quest for social justice, man, keep fighting. One foot in front of the other. And just remember that we come from a place of power. We come from a place of resilience. We come from a place of of just royalty and to be seen and to be recognized how we are and to you have to make that decision between focusing on school, focusing on your, your athletic career, and then focusing on who you are as a person and being recognized is a travesty. But do what you feel in your heart, push for what you feel for it. And I, I guarantee you there are folks that are here to support you. Um, and I am one of those. And um, after this, I'm willing to share my contact information, my phone number, my email, and do anything for you to be able to to express that mission. Um, so I hope I answered your question, but I also hope everyone on this call feels supported. You did, you did great. Um, and, to that, and to that point, I wanna have um, our, our mental health professionals come in. So, uh, and, and share, how are you working with students? How are you advising students? And understandably, this work can be taxing. There are stressors. How do you manage these stressors personally how do you monitor your mental health um, and do your protective care, especially in the midst of trying to provide space for young men and young women that are dealing with their own challenges, their own um, issues, uh, fears, grief, um, identity development um, at this stage. So again, Stephanie and then Kelly, if you can provide some, some insight for that and then we'll start jumping to some questions from our audience. All right, well, I, for me, I am trying to process what's going on myself. So that has to happen first. And working through all that, what it means for me, you know, whether how I advocate for my student athletes and what my advocacy or my activism looks like now. Like, how do I work in front of a Zoom all day long and still have, like, express my activism, take action? Cause I, I can't be zooming and downtown. So like, and so like figuring out what is going to work for me on a, on a weekday at 10 AM in terms of act, act, activism. Then secondly, I'm trying to take care of student athletes, make sure um, we are listening, make sure that we are giving them space to express all these confusing and mixed up and worrisome thoughts and emotions that they're having in a place that's safe. Because I mean, what I've noticed recently is a, adults are having difficulty with some of these conversations and the young people really m might have difficulty. So giving them a place where it's safe, where you just go, go and whatever feels authentic, whatever feels, if you cry, you cry, if you scream, you scream, like just giving them that space where they can be free to do all that and then helping them form all that into whatever their activism looks like and also being able to respect what you know that some people may not be there yet and that's okay and, you know everybody has a journey i'll say this my grandfather would have been a hundred and seven on Monday, June the 1st. And my other grandfather, my paternal grandfather would have been 109 today. And my grandfather who would have been 107 on Monday, he was the first activist I knew. So 
I'm from the Bahamas. And um, in 1973, we became independent. And my yeah. grandfather was down there in the trenches doing all that work so that we could be independent. And so it's in my blood, it's in my DNA. And so helping people figure out like, once again, helping me figure out why I'm gonna do my thing, but also helping them because there are many other people who are trying to, they want to take action. Words are very hollow. So while people are posting stuff on social media, mm -hmm. if that is all you can do, like as a matter of fact, I posted something today, like a statement is wonderful, but what does your board of directors look like? Who do you, what do your decision makers look like? Preach. Who making decisions, <laughs> who did it, what do they look like? Um, so, you know, words are hollow and I, and I try to express this to our student athletes who are, they are sad because they're, they, they're feeling like some people aren't speaking up on their behalf, but trying to help them understand like, in the words of a friend, uh, somebody I used to know, chatter doesn't matter. Like, what are you doing to affect change? So these are, and so later on, like I said, we're gonna have this open forum. And then the other thing is like helping the administrators and the, the adults who are struggling and trying to figure stuff out too, like please allow this to happen first. This is the beginning of many, for at least our institution, the beginning of many conversations. I'm committed to that. So, but let this happen first. We don't have to, build it all in one day. Racism didn't just happen last week. That got built <laughs> over 400 years. Right. So, um, so just, so these are some of the things that I'm, I'm processing and trying to, to imp convey to the student athletes, the young people who are developing right now. Right. Thank you. I mean, it is, again, I, I appreciate you talking about we as adults need time to process. So we need to expect our young people need time to process. They're not gonna speak up and give immediately. Um, as I was sharing with our own San Jose State you know, uh, Athletic Department yesterday, for some of our black athletes, they're dealing with their racial side of themselves for the very first time um, because they've had that athletic self and athletic identity at the forefront. So it takes time to sort of unpack the complex complexity of the issues and how they feel in these spaces and places. Kelly, can you give us some insight, particularly, I know you work with student athletes and again, have that, that social worker um, insight. Yeah, so I think the thing that, that we have made a commitment to do as a sports psych department is to be direct. Because I think a lot of the feedback that I'm hearing from student athletes is that coaches aren't really asking because they don't know how to ask. Their peers that are white don't really know what to say. Um, they see their peers posting on social media, but not engaging in conversation with them as a, as a student athlete, as a teammate, as a same position player. And yeah. so I think that we just process that. And so for us, it's about being direct. It's about hitting things head on. It's about providing space for them. I think we also are trying to reach out to coaches and say, hey, coach, um, I don't... I think this was just earlier, we were talking about, you guys have one at San Jose State, you have one black coach, is that correct? Head coach, so, yes. Head coach, okay. So we, I, um, I don't know off the top of my head that we have any head coaches that are black at IU. Mm -hmm. And so okay. we are, as a sports psych department, sort of offering up and saying, hey coaches, these conversations need to happen. If you need help in guiding those conversations, we're glad to process that with you, offer questions, here are some responsive answers, that are provided for context. And so we're just trying to be, we're trying to do the holistic thing, right? We're trying to help coaches understand that at, we offer nutrition, we offer mental health counseling, physical health. We don't talk a lot about culture. And so how do we look at these athletes as whole people that includes their culture in a time where, like you were saying, that they're athletes first, that's all that they've been so far. And now it's this whole nother level of, of depth to them. So for us, it's about being very direct with them. It's about providing them space. And then also uh, we're, we're doing the, um, the conversation tonight. Well, sorry, my screen's shifting everywhere. Um, we're sorry. doing the conversation tonight as well with our athletic director and our student athletes to give them a place to speak up. I think the hope for us is that um, it provides a safe space and we're gonna be observing that. And then the goal is for us, um, like you were saying, um, Stephanie, just to have 
in, in months coming, like we want to continue these conversations. And so we're going to have a conversation on Sunday night with track. And then the coach that I talked to last night said in two months from now, we're going to have another conversation and then another conversation. So I think for us, it's going to be about consistency and about keeping open dialogue. Um, and then also helping them figure out what their role is. We had a, we had a meeting last week where one of the athletes said, Hey, I want to protest, but I'm worried about that. What do I need to know about protesting as a college athlete? And so we talked through that a little bit and what that looks like and coaches chimed in a little bit in support. And so that was really great. And so I think we just have to continue being hungry for knowledge. And I will also say that as a white woman, as a woman who looks white, I have to step aside when other people are ready to step in. And like the, one of the track coaches is a black man. And so he is leading the charge and, and I am just doing anything I can to provide support for him. And so that's my role as a white woman is to do that, is to make sure that I step aside and give opportunities uh, because I think that we get lost in that, um, especially when we have a, a call and, and the majority of people are white and, and there are a few people that are black. And so I think that that's, it's just one of those things that we have to be mindful of um, as our leadership team looks predominantly white, as I'm at a predominantly white institution in a predominantly white town. Um, so just acknowledging those things as well, I think is very important for us. And also um, just being able to be supportive and recognizing that the goal is student-centered, regardless of, of, of who's leading the charge. I don't need to lead the charge. People that want to lead the charge can lead the charge as long as it's student-centered. Thank you for sharing. And I wanted to just sort of put this information up with, with regarding your alliance of social workers in sport, just what they do, the details of it, but that they've, um, you guys have done a lot of work to be at other um, universities and um, work in tandem with and conjunction with and supporting those efforts. So um, we appreciate that. Um, our time is getting close to near. I wanted to see if there were any questions from the audience um, and at the same time still allow this platform for um, each and every one of you to be able to uh, share some insight um, as to, um, you know, your kind of final thoughts on the importance of education and continuing that education um, and what that means. Um, real quick from our, our audience, um, one of our members wants to know, what advice do you have for white male coach when the squad is black, white, mixed, Muslim, Asian, Latino? Um, it said that you may meet face-to-face -face this fall. What advice do you have for a white male coach? And that's anybody can jump in. Make sure you have black assistant coaches <laughs> to, okay. to help with discussions. I had a conference call with the undefeated today and I told them that uh, maybe we should start a thing called Ask a Black Dude, like they had on the Chappelle show. I like, there's no stupid <laughs> questions. Right. I, I tell all my my friends that aren't black, like, look, man, if, if you got a question, just ask me. I have mm -hmm. reporters that call me when they're writing about sensitive topics and see how I feel about, you know, what they said. And am I saying it the right way? And that's the key and the importance of diversity. If you have more a diverse coach, it's nothing wrong with having a white head coach, but I hope he has a diverse coaching staff. I hope mm -hmm. that all these people that have put these statements, um, as uh, Dr. Coakley said, you know, have something behind the statement. Now we have receipts. So we could go back and see how diverse you actually are and if your words are really true. And so ask a black dude, ask a black person, ask how you could help. And I think the key right now for all these places is it's it's a good hashtag now. And but when it does yeah. settles, are you still gonna love us and want to fight for us? And uh hopefully such will be the case. But right now it's to me it's a it's a lot of talk and i hope that there's action to a lot of this talk so the coach hopefully you'll have some assistance that he could turn to when there's aren't aren't questions that he can answer that her, perhaps in a, a very intelligent black assistant coach can answer for him definitely and and, oh, and i will say this real quick yeah. which is yeah. a long story i actually got kicked off the San Jose state basketball team uh -oh. because of, i wrote <laughs> about the lack of black college basketball coaches at the time, and I wrote on the Spartan Daily newspaper that um, all black athletes should protest. And this was in '94. Mm -hmm. well, we could read. We could talk about that another day. Okay, another conversation. So unpacking. We'll, we'll let school. you unpack. So, but um, and I, I say yeah. all that to say, 
I, I wish we had a, a, a more diverse coaching staff. I wish we had a more diverse athletic department where they could have said to the coach, your uncomfortability is wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I should Thank have. you. <laughs> and, and as I said, um, and to your point, you know, Black Lives Matter is more than a hashtag. Again, you know, it's something that we are utilizing now, but what are those going to be? What are those conversations? What is that going to look like down the road? Um, and to Kelly and Stephanie's point, it's got to be something that's ongoing. Diversity training, uh, cultural competence training, mental health training, all of those things need to take place. Particularly, we have this time over these summer months to institute some of those things. Invest in sports social workers, invest in sports psychologists, make them parts of your team make faculty allies a part of your team again dr fletcher and i are at, at san, um, san jose state so when issues do erupt issues do arise it's not go speak to such and such and you're new but um that they've been embedded into the culture uh dr fletcher if you want to go ahead and share and then we're going to open up we have another question about specific reading strategies for educators that they can use to address um and uh, white privilege no i was just going to quickly address the, the the question about when the team meets face to face in the fall i would mm. say for for all coaches um resist the need to lean into your leadership coaching persona because for most of you you are you're not subject matter experts in what's going on right now so resist that urge, resist it, and listen more than you talk. Create that environment for your teams to where they can share how they're feeling right now, to where you can create that environment. That's leadership, is often knowing when to step back and give them that opportunity in order to emote, in order to sort of construct the environment. I'm, I'm in a few hours, uh, I'm partnering with our director for African-American uh, student success, and we're having uh, uh, just only for black students, we're having a town hall discussion. All that want to come, that'll show up. We didn't advertise it. We didn't try to get PR for it. The president of the university doesn't even know it's happening for all we know. And having those types of moments to where they can just share. We don't know what to expect at right. all. But leaning into that, I think will be something that your athletes will appreciate. And then you can take steps from there. Right. That's leadership in my opinion. Thank you so much. I wanna um, have in our final one to two minute takeaways. I want each of our panelists to, to provide some insight, whether it be a resource, whether it be a next step um, in this process, whether it be some advice for those that are seeking school and additional knowledge to um, provide some of that insight for uh, our um, attendees in these final moments. Um, as you're thinking about that, I also want to um, encourage all those um, that are watching um, that know individuals to continue to support the Institute for Sports, Society and Social Change um, through either having continued conversations with our institute and our wonderful faculty affiliates, faculty board members, executive board members as we have on this panel today to give, give, give. We need support, um, uh, those financial support to help keep doing the work and to visit our websites again to, and um, our Martin Luther King Library to view our Dr. Harry Edward uh, collection again to get that knowledge and information as we um, continue our, our conversation. So with these final moments, um, in one minute, if we, I know we can go on forever, definitely, but provide our audience um, one to two points to take away um, as we talk about this work. And we can start with, let's just go ahead and start with uh, Courtney Flowers. Uh, the one thing I would probably say as a, a quick takeaway is just realize that whatever you're doing, whatever your path is, realize that it could be impactful to somebody else. There's somebody that's looking at you, that's mirroring you, that's following your footsteps, and you may not even know it, so be aware of that. Sometimes that's even your own special way of protesting. That's your own special way of showing so, you know, social activism as well. 
uh, for the students that are here, especially looking at sport management, I would say definitely, like I tell my students all the time, teamwork online is your friend. Make sure that you get on some of the sites that house different positions in sport and make sure that you're there, make sure that your application is there. Start at home, I tell um, at Texas Southern University, I, you know, when I have a kid that comes to me and says they wanna be a coach, I said, have you talked to anybody on the coaching staff? So sometimes it's also starting at home before even looking out outward as well. Thank you. Alvin. So I'll try and make this quick, but um, my first piece of advice to you all is to um, network, network, network. If there's something that you want to do, somebody is out there doing it. If not, there's somebody that wants to do it but can't, okay? Um, network, network, network. And the second piece, don't pay for school. <laughs> don't do it. Do not, and the reason I keep saying that to you is because there are ways that you can work at the school. There are ways that you can continue to get your education, get your graduate degrees, and have that tuition remission or the subsidies put in. And that way you graduate without student loan debt, which is one of the biggest clouds over a lot of folks with graduate degrees um, and understanding that that is the biggest hurdle for a lot of people to be able to continue their educational journey or their academic journey, I should put. Um, but there's always somebody out there that's doing what you want to do or that will do um, what you're thinking of doing um, and can put you in the right places. And one more piece if I can, um, really, really quick. If you're if you're in contact with a professor on campus that's already doing what you like, ask if you can um, ask if they have grant money to take a student with them to a conference. If, mm. if it's digital right now, there's a bigger network and there's folks at that conference that would love to have you as a student and you showing that initiative and wanting to be at that conference. I know that's a big thing for NAS, which Dr. Dr. Carter Francique was the president of, past president. Um, and we always have a networking group and we try to connect each other while we're there to greater opportunities. So that is another great thing for you to be able to do. Connect with a faculty member, see if you can accompany them to a larger conference um, that's in their field, and you'll be exposed to a, a wide array of folks to increase your network. Thank you, and thanks for the NAS plug as well. I want you everybody to look for nas.org because we will be having a virtual conference coming your way. Dr. Flowers was a part of that team. Um, Amy's a bit a part of that group as well. So, and um, obviously um, Dr. Logan is a part of that and even look forward to Institute um, uh, conferences that may be coming up your way. Amy, if you could share with us a point of emphasis and a takeaway. Sure. So to kind of um, piggyback off of what Alvin was saying, um, I agree that like you shouldn't pay for grad school. Um, so for students who are interested in, in studying sport and pursuing a sport career, it's really important to have the, um, the things that are necessary to get in grad school in place before you start to apply. So number one, that means try to form relationships with professors who are doing the kind of work that you want to do. Um, and it's really hard to do that by just attending a lecture of like 200 or so. So like go to office hours, like try to see if they're doing research that you can get involved in. Because another thing that um, helps you get into grad school is having experience doing research, whether it's qualitative or quantitative. If you can like be a grunt in some professor's project, it really looks good on your CV when you go to apply. And then also having that connection with a faculty member means that they can write you a strongly worded letter of recommendation that like indicates that they really know you and they know your work ethic. So those would be my takeaways. Thank you. And you also shared a couple of books um, uh, that I wanted you to go ahead and share with the audience too. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, a so, resource. Sure. So once you, once you do um, make it into grad school, there are a couple books that um, might help you navigate that, um, the entire process from getting into grad school to being a grad student, and then even going in the job market. And one would be The Professor is In by Karen Kalski. Um, another would be, um, oh, I forget the name of the book, but it's by Jessica McCrory Calarco. Um, and it's about the hidden curriculum of higher education and navigating grad school. Um, and then the third one would be Grad School Rules by Fabio Rojas. So all three of Thank those you. would be good recommendations for people who want to go to grad school. Thank you. Uh, and then I'll also share um, again from our panelists talking about uh, addressing our question from Dr. Spencer, who's online, um, Peggy McIntosh's um, Invisible Knapsack, um, Courageous Conversations About Race um, by Glenn E. Singleton and Curtis Linton. And uh, I think Kelly's going to share our next um, insight as well. So, 
I'll have you go next. Take away. Thank you. Um, so I think one of the things that's really important that I've learned on my journey is, is that we all have our own journeys. And I think sometimes, like, I am, I'm not a doctor. I do not have a PhD yet. And, and I'm a little intimidated by all these uh, doctor labels that are underneath all these names of these beautiful people that I'm with. But, but that's not my journey right now. Is that something I would like to have? Yes, eventually we're going to work towards that. And so I think one of the really important things in a, in a culture that is Instagram pretty and is always, things are always manicured and we're always checking all the boxes and trying to compare or, or outdo or do as much as other people are doing. I think it's really important to trust your journey and to live into the gifts that you've been given. I could not do any of this um, without really walking boldly in, in who I am. And you wouldn't want me to be your financial advisor because that's not where my gifts are. And so I think it's just, I just want to remind um, the coaches and the students and, and even just myself that, that it's really important to use the strengths that you've been given in the space in which you're provided. Um, and I think that that's a thing that we can, you know, as we think about encouraging students to be activists, as we think about trying to figure out what to do at institutions and what role people should play, I want to, make sure that we're using our strengths. Not everybody can go out and protest downtown Indianapolis every night. Not everyone can, you know, go volunteer every day, but you can vote and you can work at the food pantry and you can do the things that you've been gifted. And so I think that that's really important because oftentimes we want to do what other people are doing without acknowledging the things and the gifts and the strengths that we have to offer. Thank it's very you social. So much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, let's go to Mark Spears. I think you're muted again. I do these things all the time and I still forget to do these. <laughs> um, differentiate okay. yourself, as I said earlier, differentiate yourself from everybody else so that when you go, when you graduate and they start looking at you for jobs, they'll say, oh, this guy's, this lady, they're better. Um, join an organization, the National Association of Black Journalists was tremendous in my journey as a journalist and helping me uh, rise up. Uh, the squeaky wheel gets to oil. Now more than ever, you guys have the ability through Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, to reach out to people in fields that are experienced and successful where you could ask them questions, uh, perhaps get some insight on what to do in your career and just bug them to, to squeeze that information out of them. And last thing for the student athletes, do not use being a student athlete as an excuse for not getting any experience. I, I know you got practice, I know you got games, and I know you gotta work out, but find some time to get that internship done instead of going on a date, hanging with your homies. Make sure you use whatever little free time you have outside of studying and, and athletics to get some experience in the field that you're interested in. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Coakley. And I'm going to support you with an image because I know that you can share uh, a couple of texts uh, with our audience. So, yeah, get it. fantastic. And actually, the book is there that I just put in the chat. So, how to be an anti-racist. He's a um, Temple alum, but my my pieces are very brief. Do good work. So, regardless of where you are in your journey, because we're all. We've already attested to the fact that we all have a different journey. Wherever you are, do good work. So if you're a student, if you're at home and it's the summertime and you're not doing any work, that means you're not following this advice right now. So that's where your internship is. If you can't get an internship, start writing a blog. If you can't do that, like start a podcast. Like to Kelly's point, what are your strengths? And try to attack the problem from a very, that your strengths, strength-based place. And the other thing is, you're going to fail, so be okay with that, because that's one of the thing that one of the things that trips people up. They they meet adversity, and they take it as the end of the road, as opposed to like a step in the road or a bend in the road. So be okay with failure, because um, it's like fertilizer. Got this from another friend. It's like fertilizer. <laughs> it stinks. Nobody wants <laughs> it. But guess what? It causes us to flourish because that's how we learn. We learn in those places of failure and discomfort. Thank you so much. And our final word I'll leave to our own in-house uh, professor, Dr. Sean Fletcher. A, a couple of things. Uh, first off, this has been fantastic, so thank you. Um, 
I would say have a plan and find a mentor. Um, uh, hopefully you've gleaned from much of what we've talked about and each of us sharing our respective journeys and the rest of the conversation. The, hopefully you've taken away some of the cautionary tales, the cautionary notes, whether it be um, finding a career path, whether it be deciding if graduate school is the right move and yes. when it's the right move. And if it fits for your unique wants, if you don't know where you may want to go, how can you start taking expensive routes to get there? You don't want to do that. I have no problem with telling students, graduate school isn't for you right now. Much like mm -hmm. my peers said, find the right perspective. And also when you're looking for a mentor, be very cautious with those mentors who only tell you from the perspective of when they did it 20, 25, mm -hmm years ago uh your existence and environment is different all right while they should bring some of the learnings that they have from their past and i don't consider myself old but relative and my students will remind me i'm not <laughs> young so from that perspective even i don't bring some of what i learned 15 20 years ago going through grad school to present mentoring it has to be this, this blending, this natural blending to where I learn more about what you're doing and what you're navigating. That's why they need to be very plugged in to the current atmosphere and industries that allow for them to give you some very timely advice. And it also allows for them to vet your strategy. All right, you come up with a strategy that I, I went through this exercise with a student last week I just say, go back and vet everything you just told me. Go look through all these industries and jobs you keep saying that you want. Give me some examples of people that went through them. Tell me what steps they took. And then you apply that to yourself. And she did the exercise and decided, you know what? I'm not gonna major in PR, Dr. Fletcher. I'm gonna major in this other place you told me to go. And I was totally okay with that because she, did a, she took a measured approach. She, it's the old cliche, she measured twice and she cut once. And the last piece of advice here, the question came in about some of the resources. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of great books, but if you're anything like me, I like moving pictures. So mm -hmm. from that perspective, I've been really heavy on James Baldwin. Um, mm -hmm noted novelist, playwright, activist. If you don't know who he is, please look him up. Uh, do yourself a favor. Two, two interviews and two, two clips that I would suggest, they're pretty long, that I would suggest that you look up. One is his conversation with, with the great Nikki Giovanni, a very young Nikki Giovanni, where they dive into all sorts of issues as it relates to race in America, as it relates to identity development, and they also dive into some other social identities as Nikki Giovanni beautifully brings up. And then the last piece is take a look at the interview that James Baldwin gave and his remarks uh, on the Negro and the American promise. Take a look at that. It will change your perspective. It will change the way that you view some of these conversations as someone mentioned earlier that you have with your teams and your students and your colleagues. It will give you a measure of perspective and a resource to give them as well to where you're not just speaking rhetorically. You can show that you've done the work. Ooh, again, mic drop. <laughs> If everyone can give me a round of applause for these wonderful and amazing scholars, um, individuals, just human beings that we have. Um, Amy August, thank you for joining us. Dr. Stephanie Coakley, thank you for joining us. Kelly Monadero, Dr. Sean Fletcher, Courtney Flowers, Alvin Logan, and our, our homegrown Mark Spears. Um, I wanna thank each and every one of you for joining us today. Even to send a shout out to Farlon Toussaint, who is doing, again, um, some amazing work with Laureus. Uh, and thank each and every one of you for joining this webinar today. We will have it available for you, um, you know, within the week. Uh, PowerPoint will be uh, provided for you as well with the resources that our panelists spoke about. Um, we continue, um, want you to continue to join the conversation. Um, to Dr. Flesher's point about mentors, I will be speaking on mentors in a couple of weeks with the Spartan Success Series. So please look on our website for more information about that as well. I thank each and every one of you for taking the time um, and continuing to do the work.
again, as I spoke about in the beginning of this presentation, um, when we talk about the Institute for Sports Society and Social Change, I want you to continue to push the, ba push the boundaries of society, sport, and education through activism. And so that's all I have. Thank you. Words to action, everybody. Bye. Bye, thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Thank you.